from 11FS. This is Fintech Insider News, and I'm your host, Benjamin Ensor. We've got another show full of great stories and big conversations for you. Listen for Nat West's Rose Review reveals a record 150,000 new firms founded by women in the UK. And among other things, uh, we talked about the roles that men could play, particularly men who currently work in fintech firms, of encouraging the women who currently work for them, giving them a wider understanding of their businesses to help give them the confidence to go and start up new fintechs. We talked about JP Morgan banning chat GPT. We talked about the amazing potential of artificial intelligence, but also the potential risks of confidential information maybe slipping out and talked about whether there are sandboxes and other ways in which the technology can be used without putting any confidential data at risk. And should you tip your landlord? Uh, The answer from the panelists was a fairly resounding no, um, but perhaps people like doctors and nurses should be tipped and perhaps every employee should earn a living wage. We get into all this and much more. But first, a few brief messages. Stick with us. A lot of you know 11FS for our chart-topping podcasts, our events, videos, reports, and a bunch of other cool stuff that we do. But what a lot of you don't know is that this is just all our side hustle. We do so much more than that. At 11FS Ventures, we're partnering with ambitious businesses around the world to design, build, and launch truly digital financial services. We are building banks, shaping new propositions, and growing existing offerings that change the fabric of financial services. And our design, research, strategy, strategy and engineering experts are working to improve your customer's relationship with money. To find out a little bit more, check us out at 11fs.com forward slash ventures. This is Fintech Insider After Dark. We are breaking out of the studio and bringing it to the community. It's a live recording of the Fintech Insider podcast featuring your favorite hosts and big name guests. Well, thank you very much for having me back. Join us and become a certified Fintech Insider. Whether it's beers in London or pizza in New York, catch up with Fintech geeks and make new friends across the financial services ecosystem. This is packed out, right? It's standing yeah. moment. We are bringing After Dark to the Steel Yard in London on the 29th of March. Click the link in the podcast description or visit 11fs.com forward slash after dark. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Good night. Welcome to episode 713 of Fintech Insider. I'm Benjamin Ensor, Director of Research and Strategy at 11FS, and I'm joined this week on Fintech Insider News by three great guests, all of whom we liked so much that they've all been on the show before. So welcome back to help me break down this week's biggest stories in fintech and financial services. So firstly, it's a welcome return appearance for Lena Heckler, CEO and founder of Bright Payment in Sweden. Thank you so much for joining us. What can you tell our listeners about Bright Payments? Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, Bright Payments, we provide instant payments based on open banking technology all across Europe, which means that we allow consumers to make payments only using their bank account and now a total of 24 markets. And that also means that we provide instant payouts, for example, so receiving money to your bank account as well. Fantastic. And also, making a welcome return to Fintech Insider, we have Ruth fox Blader, a partner at Anthemis. Welcome back to the show, Ruth. Can you give our new listeners a brief introduction to you and to Anthemis, please? Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. Anthemis is a venture capital firm focused on facilitating positive change in financial services. We have been active for more than a decade, have uh, more than 200 portfolio companies, and I'm a partner at Anthemis. Thank you and welcome back. And finally, we have a return to Fintech Insider for Mary Agbasanwa, Fintech Growth Lead at Seckel. Welcome back to the show, Mary. Can you remind our listeners a little bit about you and Seckel, please? Yes, sure thing. Really excited to be back on the podcast as I'm an avid listener. Um, So my name, as you said, is Mary Agbasanwa. I'm really passionate about how tech is transforming wealth management and supporting millennials to achieve their full potential. My role at Seckle is fintech growth lead, so everything to do with growth and sales with fintechs that are looking to launch wealth management platforms and investment apps in the UK. 
Um, and as Seco as a whole, we are kind of the home of UK World Tech. We are a technology provider and custodian focused on helping people launch investment propositions and apps. Fantastic. Well, welcome back. All right. Well, let's get into the news. So our first story was reported in City AM in the UK, which is that a record 150,000 new firms were founded by women in the UK last year, according to a report by NatWest. A record 150,000 new firms were founded by women, according to this major review by NatWest Chief Executive Dame Alison Rose. New figures outlined in the Rose Review Progress Report for 2022 show that female entrepreneurs started twice as many companies last year as they did in 2018. There was also an increase in the number of all-female-led businesses, up 16% on the previous year. Looking ahead, the review has laid down an ambitious target to double the number of female angel investors through the Women Angel Investment Task Force. Lena, let's come to you first as someone who's founded a successful company. What are some of the challenges that are specific to being a woman in, in setting up a company? So for the half of our listeners who are not women, what, 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 what are challenge, what's challenging about being a woman in setting up a company? Um, I would say if we look at fintech in particular, um, that is, of course, a very male dominated space, which means that a lot of the people that you'll interface with as a founder will be more used to being in touch with male counterparts. And sometimes um, you might be the first female founder they speak to. Most of the funds, for example, on the funding side, and I know that we have Ruth on the podcast today who can probably speak rather credibly to the other side of that um, from her point of view. Most of the funds that I've spoken to have either very few female founders in the tech space or none of them so far. Um, so that, of course, means that the experience is somewhat new to the counterpart that you're dealing with. And um, that is, I think, um, something that is, that is interesting to navigate as you're starting your own business. Um, as for my personal journey, I had an advantage that I had been in the space that I founded my company in in fintech for quite a long period of time. And I also did it in Sweden, which is one of the countries that has ranks highest amongst uh, in the world, actually, in terms of gender parity. Then, of course, I was really happy to see this report um, because, of course, it's only a matter of time until this changes. Um, as we see more females in fintech basically rising through the ranks and taking senior positions, we will also be seeing more female founders. And I'm very certain that is the case. Um, so over time, I think the experience will, of course, change. Let's bring you in, Ruth, as, as uh, Lena's already sort of mentioned you. Uh, how, how important are sort of supportive VCs to the success of, of female founders? What have you seen being done to try and in increase the number of um, female-led businesses? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and I'm going to say a couple of very contradictory things. Um, and so, first of all, at Anthemis, uh, we're very focused on uh, equality in general and on gender parity. And what that means is we try to treat everybody equally. Um, we have, uh, you know, disproportionately high, you know, number of female-founded businesses of diverse founders in our portfolio. And we really believe that excellence is evenly distributed. And if you look, it's not hard to find those folks. We also, I, I guess I'll say a few more things about that. We have a female innovators lab. So if you are a female uh, founder in fintech at the earliest stages of your journey, my colleague Katie Palantar is, is a great person to reach out to. That's something that we do in order to encourage um, women who might uh, feel uncomfortable starting a, a fintech startup for whatever reason um, to get support from a great and knowledgeable, supportive network of, of women investors and, and other founders. I have also co-founded with my wonderful colleague, Sophie Winwood, a an organization called WVCE, uh, which is an organization dedicated to supporting women and supporting uh, inclusivity in venture and tech in Europe. And so strongly encourage anybody who's interested to get involved and get in touch. It is an awesome, organization for anyone who loves venture capital. That said, you know, I think it's, it's very difficult for these organizations or just having um, female venture capital investors uh, to solve the enormous inequalities in tech and in, you know, society generally. We can't ignore the underlying social conditions and the kind of challenges um, that women face throughout their lives, which contribute 
to this inequality. In some ways, this is like a, the end of a long journey. What we see is that uh, female-founded startups are still only receiving about 2% of venture capital investment. Those are astounding figures. And so things like having more women in venture capital or as investors, unfortunately, isn't the entire solution there. I was just reading a really interesting study by a woman named Kaisa Snellman about some of the perverse effects of having you know, only female founders investing in female companies. I think too often we, when we talk about uh, inequality, we focus on the group that's being discriminated against and ask them to come up with the solution. I think that, you know, I've been on this podcast a number of times, and this is the only time that I've, uh, that I've been with uh, all female guests, I think, and, and we happen to be talking about this issue. So, you know, I would say, let's invite men into the conversation and, you know, let's change this industry together. I don't think it was deliberate that we invited three, three, three ladies for this particular particular story, but you, you, you're making a number of really, really good points. Mary, Mary let's, let's bring you in. I, I don't want to avoid the fact that I'm the only man in the conversation, but um, what, 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 what do you see as some of the biggest barriers for women in, in fintech? Yeah, sure. I would definitely echo what Lena and Ruth have already shared, um, but I definitely think there's a lot about access access to opportunities, um, particularly when we think about more senior roles. We know that when it comes to the founder levels or kind of senior individuals at various companies, we don't tend to see good amount of gender balance and diversity across fintech in those spaces. The report also touches on, I guess, women starting their own businesses. And it's so good to see those rates increasing. And I'm a big advocate of talking about side hustles. It's an unfortunate fact that many women also have kind of child caring responsibilities, caring responsibilities in general. But what is interesting is that one in three adults in the UK has a side hustle. And actually women are starting side hustles at an increasing rate than men. So I definitely think we should talk more about how side hustles can be a way for people to um, dip their toes into entrepreneurship and trying out starting a business um, and the community they can get from that as well. So outside of work, I've been running a community for female side hustlers full of women working in technology and financial services. And for a lot of them, side hustles are not only a way to earn additional income, but also to gain new skills, network with other women, and yeah, maybe just gain a bit of confidence that they're not getting from their day job for multiple different reasons. And I think the last thing to mention is kind of the network and um, community. I think the report also touches on the fact that women still need access to networking opportunities. They still need access to places where they can meet VCs and angels. And there's still more strides to be done in that space as well. That's a re- I love the point about side hustles. I'm also still thinking about the the point Ruth made about how often we in society do sort of expect that people who have the problem to fix it rather than actually everyone else needing to fix it. Um, I know if I asked my wife, you know, what what should I do? She'd tell me, you know, do more housework. And that is part of it, right? You know, women do carry more of the burden of childcare and, and... and housework, um, and you know, I'm culpable of that, as as are many men. But to the men who are listening on this, what what should men be doing to try and help change this? This, Lena, perhaps you can give us an an example or two. What what can men who want to try and help change this picture? What sorts of things can and should people doing? I mean, Mary was already giving some examples, but what what, what sort of things should people do? No, no, I think there is there is much to be done there. So when we talk about basically um, supporting female founders, I think um, if we focus on the investment side, that's a really relevant piece. But I think um, a lot of founding journeys start much sooner, obviously, than that. And I think the decision to build a company is often taken um, during an employment, as was the case for myself and I know for many other founders. So basically, a female or a female that is likely to f- start a new fintech is probably already working in a fintech company at this very moment in time. And I think one of the things that have been um, most helpful to me, um, if I may sort of uh, speak from my personal experience, is getting a pretty broad insight into the business as a whole and having very supportive managers. So I think empowering females that are currently working in fintech will most definitely foster 
um, culture and confidence to start your own business. So I think as a, as a male manager in a fintech right now, I think basically raising and lifting the females that you already have working with you would be one way to start um, if you wanted to look at sort of the, the beginning of the journey. And um, but then, of course, ensuring basically career development, and allowing females to get experience in different areas of the business, um, I think is really helpful as a founder, whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. Um, just having seen different parts, I think can also be really, really beneficial. So that would probably be where I would start. I guess, you know, when, if we, if we return to sort of the previous examples of, of what can men do or, or what can, you know, male investors do, you know, spend time with women. I think that <laughs> investors tend to, yeah, I really, I, I think it's, I think that there's investors tend to build sort of pattern recognition devices where they like, you know, a certain kind of founder that they've had success with or someone who reminds them of themselves. And I think this is one of the biggest kind of systemic challenges in venture capital is inherently if you're a woman and you're speaking to a man, you know, you, you, there's a little bit of a bridge before you remind him of himself. And so I really, you know, I, I've often sat on panels about diversity where um, male investors will say, well, you know, I really care about this issue because I have a daughter. And, and I always say, well, I really care about this issue because I have two daughters and I have two sons. And I want to live in a world where, you know, they are equally represented and have equal opportunities to do amazing things. And so, you know, let's, let's really think about the ways in which we kind of hear people, listen to people and believe people and, um, and, and spend some time together. Really well said. Thank you. Okay, um, we need to move on to our next story, much as this is a, is a big one. So our next story is that JP Morgan is restricting its staff from using the artificial intelligence bot ChatGBT. So JP Morgan Chase has barred its employees from using the ChatGBT chatbot. Currently, the artificial intelligence software is restricted with the move affecting employees across the bank. JP Morgan's decision was not triggered by any specific incident and is part of broader controls around third-party software. The AI-powered platform creates text, photos, and other media in response to a brief prompt. This has sparked a debate about its potential for everything from creating stock portfolios to writing poems. Even an exchange-traded fund is being considered around the idea, according to various reports. JP Morgan now joins Goldman Sachs, Citi, Deutsche Bank, and others that have also reportedly restricted access to the technology. So we at 11FS put a poll on the 11FS LinkedIn page asking, should financial services companies ban their employees from using chat GBT? With more than 240 responses from you, our listeners, 35% of you said, ban it, and 65% said, let them chat. Um, so what's the panel's view on our poll question? Um, ban it or embrace it? Mary, what, what do you think? I think I'm definitely more in team embrace it. I think that it's never a good idea to ban emerging technology, particularly emerging technology that seems to have taken so many people's interests. I've had Gen Z cousins of mine, I've had my parents ask me questions about ChatGPT, and I think that's really, really exciting. Um, so I'm more team embrace it. I think there's so many amazing use cases that are being shown, and I think we should all be interested in exploring that. Lena, what's what's your thought? Are you happy with all of your employees um, spending all their time on ChatGPT? I am. I, I must say, I second Mary here. Absolutely. I, I feel like if if an artificial intelligence can do the task, most likely it is not the most stimulating task for my for my team to be working on. So if they can be helped um, through ChatGPT, then I'm all for it. Ruth, is is JP Morgan? overreacting here are they you know they're trying to stop the tide coming in or are there sort of some legitimate reasons why actually uh, they might have a, a, a logic or a case yeah i mean this. first of all if you want everyone to use it please ban it um <laughs> but no in seriousness uh you know i actually think that it's perfectly reasonable it's it's the paradigm of large organizations in any case you know that you kind of restrict access uh, in the first instance and then only open up access when things are proven or when you fully understand them. And we certainly don't fully understand this technology. I think that there are also regulatory and compliance considerations, which are probably at the, the front of mind for these large organizations and, you know, the explainability issues on the decisions that algorithms make. 
I think will make them highly challenging for financial services, the financial services industry for years to come. Generally, we see that we live within a compliance framework, which is kind of built for the 20th century at best. And we're dealing with some, um, you know, very new technologies, the implications of which are not fully understood. So in some ways, I do understand the perhaps the hesitancy uh, in this instance. I think that what we will end up seeing is that, in fact, there are some structural or infrastructure sort of solutions that start to arise from these types of technologies. I'm thinking of the problem of large financial institutions of recruiting excellent tech talent. And when you see, you know, the way that these, um, that these AI programs really can facilitate coding, can facilitate software development, you know, we might start seeing that certain areas of financial institutions actually open up sandboxes around these very specific problem sets uh, where there's, there are going to just be absolutely massive advances uh, in multiple industries and certainly on the infrastructure side. And I also believe that the banks that do open up these sandboxes first are going to win. And so right now, I think there's a, a really interesting moment in financial services where some thoughtfulness around this is going to provide competitive advantage uh, to the organizations which are thoughtful. It's interesting that you use the term sandbox because you're implying some kind of um, sort of um, guardrails around it. You know, the idea of a sandbox is it's slightly separated mm. and that it's a sort of safe environment for children to play in. It sounds as though what you're advocating is some maybe standalone, I mean, I, I hate to say on-premise <laughs> artificial in, intelligence system. Is that what you're thinking? Because I wonder whether one of the risks here or one of the, the reasons JP Morgan's a little bit concerned is obviously there's a huge amount of sensitive information sitting inside all the investment banks that could potentially leak out. And perhaps that's the concern is that an employee might inadvertently, you know, type in something about some takeover or some highly sensitive mm -hmm. piece of information. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I think uh, you know, well, I didn't call them children. No, but, <laughs> I did. Um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. No, but I think, um, yeah, but I mean, these are experimental technologies. I mean, you need safe places to experiment. Certainly, you know, whether it's exposing uh, competitive information or whether uh, it's, it's running the risk of, of falling afoul of the regulator, uh, it's right and, and proper, perhaps, to be a little bit cautious. Mary, what do you see as some of the, the, the upside here? Because uh, you know, how, how do you think this technology could, could change or improve wealth management? Um, what do you see as sort of some of the upsides, some of the positives? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I definitely agree with what Ruth is saying, that it is a two-sided problem and that we have to look at the pros and cons. I think um, I've seen a lot of kind of doom and gloom articles saying that ChatGBT and other AI is going to render many wealth managers redundant and they need to start looking for other jobs and things like that. But I would say, I guess, at Seckle, we've been thinking about AI just at the grassroots levels and playing around with ChatGBT and thinking about some maybe marketing and communication um, use cases. And I think it's a really valuable research tool for just kind of really elementary, generally quite simplified things, as Lena said, like really rudimentary tasks that you would want to speed up anyway, maybe creating content um, to go out online and just refining it and creating multiple different versions of something. But I'm really excited to see how um, it could be used around providing advice and guidance within financial services and wealth management. Um, as we know, only 3% of adults receive financial advice on a recurring basis. So if we could use a tool like ChatGBT um, to democratize uh, financial advice, and we're always talking about this horizon of hybrid advice at Zecco and understanding that there's loads of people that need, I guess, a good amount of advice, but they don't need advice with a capital A, they don't have an estate of a million pounds, and they're thinking about how to divide all those different assets. So thinking about how it could be used in those kind of scenarios is really, really interesting, whilst also recognising 
um, some of the challenges and security and things like that as well. But yeah, maybe hybrid advice will be distributed in some kind of AI format and maybe eventually supersede DIY investing. I absolutely love that, Mary. I, I've, I've been saying for years to anyone who listened to me, which is virtually no one, that, that um, financial advice is the, is the last big unsolved problem in retail financial services. I mean, that, you know, there are plenty of other challenges, but that one, as you say, so, so few people get good financial advice. So I absolutely love that. Um, Lena, I loved what you were saying earlier about how, you know, if any of your employees are, are doing tasks that chat GPT can do better, that's sort of a bit of a waste of their time. So you're really pleased about it. What, what are the opportunities you see for sort of AI uh, in financial services, either at Bright Payments or, or more widely? I mean, I think that sort of in the, the debate, as I've been following it over the past couple of days, that there was a lot of talk about sort of a fairly complex application. And to some extent, maybe even as, as Mary was alluding to, sort of a talk around sort of is AI eventually going to be replacing um, human workers or will they potentially even take on its own life? I've, I've seen questions like this as well. And I feel that we're jumping the gun a little bit because, I mean, clearly it's still in its, in its infancy and in the bigger scheme of things. And to be honest, at this very point in time, if you if you look at sort of a lot of consumer facing financial services business such as our own or many others payments companies or uh, lending businesses you name it and many of them will be hard pressed to even provide a properly function chatbot <laughs> to begin <laughs> with i mean like honestly if you sort of look at sort of uh, like the the interactions that you typically have with that level or software on that level they're not particularly great so i think looking at the basics there's a lot of things that can be improved um, before even looking at sort of a wider application and then personally, of course, when I think of um, chat GPT in its current state, I primarily think of basically the web interface. I don't even think about sort of a you know, deeper integration into the business because certainly that will have its challenges, um, especially you know, in the regulated um, uh, business where you have a lot of personal data that you have to c consider. There is pretty tight rules around what information can be shared in terms of outsourcing and where those services are located. For, so that basically, of course, is a lot more complex. And I think that will be um, more, well, that will need to be assessed in a lot more detail um, before we even can talk about those applications. Yeah, and, and Ruth made, made a really some really good points about you know the importance of being able to explain decisions taken by AI mm. and, and so on. Okay, um, well, we're coming to the end of this this particular story, Ruth. Maybe I'll come back to you for sort of a, a last few. How how is Anthemis sort of looking at AI? In general, is that sort of changing your view on your sort of overall portfolio? Is it is it sort of changing Anthemis's thinking about how the future might evolve at all? Maybe that's too big a question. I don't know. No, it's not too big of a question at all. It's it's not actually. I mean, we're thesis focused investors, so um, we you know tend to look at the long term time horizons for horizontal technologies that might impact the industry and the, and artificial intelligence. Uh, has been on our radar for some time. You know, it's a bit of a flavor of the month, and there are a lot of jokes on Twitter about how, you know, all the crypto VCs and our AI VCs and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I, but I would say that the analogy is really, it's not totally inaccurate. I mean, we very rarely invest in a, you know, a blockchain company, but many of our companies might have some, you know, blockchain feature, which will, you know, be some, you know, some sort of distributed ledger feature as, as part of the underlying technology. And I would say that, you know, many of our companies are already availing themselves of the use of artificial intelligence in one form or another. We're seeing some really exciting advances and we are, we definitely have that on the radar, but, you know, this is one of the tools in the toolkit um, and not necessarily uh, something that we have sufficient expertise to be uh, investing in, in that core tech on. Um, I think that there we'll see artificial intelligence figure into far more pitches than than perhaps we did before there was there was all this discussion. But that's just natural. I mean, there are technology trends, and uh, certainly it's one that we're following. I think this is going to have a huge impact on our lives and uh, our, our children's lives. Um, so we're definitely going to be talking and thinking a lot more about this, aren't we? Okay, we're just going to take a quick pause here, and we will be back very shortly. <music> Buying a home is the biggest and most significant purchase most people make in their lifetime. And it doesn't matter where in the world you're buying, the process is rarely easy. In our latest report, experts from our 11FS Ventures team look at why the home buying process is broken, how we can fix it, and the massive commercial opportunity it presents for banks and fintechs. Download your free copy at 11FS.com homebuying. 
That's 11fs.com slash home buying. Welcome back. Before we get on to the next half of today's news, a quick reminder to go and check out the latest episode of our FinTech Insider Insights show. My colleague David Barton Grimley was joined by expert guests from HSBC, Fiat Republic and Ampla to ask, how does embedded finance make money? Sometimes it's all about the bottom line. So how do players handle the costs and potential revenue of embedded financial services? So go and check that out wherever you got this podcast. Why not queue it up in your podcast app after this one? Okay, let's get into our next story. This is that French banking group BNP Paribas has been sued by NGOs, non-governmental organizations, over Amazon deforestation links. This was reported by Reuters. A collection of environmental and human rights activist groups have sued BNP Paribas, the Eurozone's biggest bank, for providing financial services to companies that they allege contribute to the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. Brazilian NGO Comissão Pastoral da Terra and French group Notre Affaire à Tu said they filed a lawsuit with the Paris Judicial Court and alleged the bank did not carry out proper checks before agreeing to finance such companies. Paris-based BNP Paribas said in a statement sent to Reuters that it required its clients to have a zero deforestation strategy in their production and supply chains by 2025. Forest destruction is Brazil's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and climate campaigners are increasingly using lawsuits to push big companies to shift to a low-carbon economy. So this is a pretty controversial area, and Difficult for banks to navigate. Mary, what did what did you think about this story? Is is BNP Paribas perhaps a bit of an unfair victim here, or do you think banks like BNP Paribas are perhaps not doing enough? I think it's a really interesting story, and I think I guess we've gone from the phase of ESG where everyone was just using that algorithm and excited to talk about. Um, the environment and green neo banks and different things like that um, to people actually wanting to be able to measure um, when we're calling things ESG. So I think I see it as a wider sign across financial services of consumer expectations being higher around how we're labeling things, um, as we've seen with some of the greenwashing around it happening in wealth management and individuals calling that out and calling out certain companies as well. So I think it's it's indicative of a wider trend of, I guess, how do we go a bit more into the data and back up what we're saying around ESG and um, environment and the allegations we make around, um, I guess, how good some of our products look as well. Ruth, what, what did you think? Because one of the things that struck me about this is, you know, they're talking about doing things by 2025. Is that soon enough? Are banks moving fast enough? Is the industry, the financial services industry, moving fast enough to address some of these challenges? Obviously, it's it's highly complex. And I think that really what is being called into question is whether or not some of these claims, which are completely uncontroversial because we all want to live on this planet, actually you know, have any teeth. And that the fact, you know, I agree with Mary, the fact that people are using the courts or that NGOs are using the courts is sort of interesting. I think we're seeing that more and more across a number of different industries. And, you know, I think as as people are perhaps losing a bit of faith in governments or in large organizations, you know, they are going to take recourse to litigation. And we're seeing that in crypto in the United States. And I think if we start to see that, you know, increasingly on climate, um, you know, we probably need to try to examine why why we feel like either, you know, corporate governance, shareholders or or elected officials, you know, are falling short such that the the legal system is sort of used, being used to redress some of these issues. I personally started uh, my career in financial services in the insurance industry, and the insurance industry was one of the first industries to really talk about taking action against climate change, uh, partly you know, because of the absolutely enormous impact uh, to its bottom line by increased weather volatility and uh, much more dramatic catastrophic weather events. But banks have the same issue. You know, they have exposures to climate risk. They have exposures to, you know, people giving loans to to farmers in, in places where there is increasing climate catastrophe. 
and there is crop destruction or deforestation, and those farmers are unable to pay their loans back. You know, the all all business is is being impacted by the climate crisis. I don't know if any one bank can be responsible for sort of turning that tide, but I think that it's interesting to see that you know these organizations are going to use uh, whatever arrows they have in their quiver to uh, ask uh, large, powerful organizations to redress their concerns. Lena, leaving aside the sort of specifics of this of this particular case, um, it, the consumers in the Nordic countries are sort of well known for. Um, being a little bit ahead of the rest of the world in, in a variety of ways, including equality, as you mentioned earlier, and also sort of awareness of climate catastrophes and, and so on. Do you, do you feel that customers want banks to behave ethically and, in, in, and protect the environment? Do you get a strong sense that that's important to the majority of customers? Or is it just a sort of rich world, you know, wealthy people until the cost of living comes, a crisis comes along and then suddenly everyone forgets about it? Do you think this is a sort of fundamental thing that people really care about? I, I do believe that, yes. I do think that there is a call for greater accountability, um, especially in financial services and especially when it comes to large banks, not only when it comes to the environmental impact, but also, for example, if we look at um, topics such as consumer credit, for example, and rising consumer debt and the, the, the role that banks play in that context, which is ultimately also an impact on society. And I would um, uh, sort of uh, categorize as being a part of ESG. Um, so I think definitely the consumer voice is being heard. What I also think then, on the other hand, though, is that... Um, um, we have to be realistic around a single bank's capacities and the way that sort of the that the tools that are available to them in this context, because it's one thing, obviously, to have a policy, um, which is the case in, in this particular news article. And then we can have a debate around the timeline of that. And if that is uh, uh, something that we would consider to be acceptable. But I think um, ultimately also it's, it's important to see that banks are one layer away and asking banks to to sort of go into the depths of each and every one of their client supply chain, for example, will be challenging. I think that's just reality. And I think there's many examples. I mean, me, myself, coming from the payments world, um, we supply a, a service to, to merchants, to, of, of the retailers of, of different kinds. We also operate on the back of policies. And while we certainly can make sure that they abide by those policies as we onboard them, um, compliance further down the road, especially at scale, if you're catering to 50, 60, 100,000 customers at some point or merchants, um, is always a different story. So I'm, um, I'm very much on board with there being more accountability. Um, but I also think that we need to be realistic around um, how to what extent it can be enforced, especially if there is um, sort of a number of different players or a number of different banks, for example, involved and sort of how they also then, how their behavior in this context impacts upon um, basically each other and the different market participants, so to say. So that's my, my view. Yeah, I mean, I agree on the re realistic point, but on the other hand, the planet is running out of time. So, oh, yeah, um, definitely. Mary, I want to bring you in because Lena made a really interesting point there about the, the difficulty of for individual investors or, or customers or even large banking groups of sort of knowing exactly what's going on in their portfolios and so on. Do you see any sort of technology solutions or infrastructure ways of sort of helping large groups sort of understand what's in their portfolios or keep track? Um, do you think there's a sort of technology answer to sort of understanding what's in portfolios? Yes, I definitely think there is. I guess on one side, related to the increased consumer appetite for impact investing and investing, I guess, aligned with their values. What we've seen at SECO, given we take care of the custody, the trading and the execution on behalf of our clients that want to launch investment apps and propositions is that this frees up more time for them to think about their proposition and how they're building segment specific features for these people. So features like rounding up to plant trees or all sorts of things like that um, have really helped gain customer acquisition and traction and ultimately please customers and keep them stickier um, and keep them around for longer as well. But I'm hearing more and more conversation about kind of ESG profiling tools being used in risk management, but also in wealth management as well. Um, and I think that's really exciting so that we can actually start to decipher who's been shouting the loudest versus who's actually doing something concrete in this space as well. Yeah, that's that's very much needed. I think we're going to hear more and more about this, this the, the, the urgency of the whole financial services industry reducing carbon emissions across the planet as a whole. This is, I think, going to become a more and more important topic for the remainder of our lifetimes. Okay. 
Let's go on to our next story, which is that Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz invested more in fintech than in any other sector in 2022. This was reported in TechCrunch. So leading venture capital firm Sequoia Capital and Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z, invested more money in fintech than any other category in 2022, according to research from CB Insights. Sequoia apparently was fairly active overall last year, despite the global downturn, with over 100 investments, and fintech represented nearly a quarter of the firm's deals. Meanwhile, of the 206 deals that A16Z participated in last year, almost a quarter went to fintech companies, again, more than any other industry. Sequoia backed 25 companies in financial services last year. Its top three fintech targets were capital markets, payments, and payroll and benefits. A16Z, meanwhile, backed 49 companies in fintech, and its top three fintech targets were payments, blockchain, and digital lending. Ruth, has fintech's demise been greatly exaggerated? (laughs) Um, Yes, it has. I think, you know, that just in short, there's still so much work to do in financial services. The technology is really old. Everything new that comes out and that consumers engage with uh, has potential to be useful in financial services in some way. And, you know, like at Anthemis, we really believe that financial services is the backbone to society. And so there's just this uh, ever-present need to refresh and change and renew um, the way that consumers can engage with financial services. We have enormous protection gaps. We have, you know, unbanked people all over the world. There's just so much work left to do. And frankly, so so many exciting things that technology can do to continue to transform financial services. Now, what has not been exaggerated, and certainly at the late stages of venture capital, is the compression of valuation multiples and uh, and, an overall decline of valuations in the space. Um, And so, you know, the attractiveness of doing certain kinds of deals and the sort of perpetually available pool of capital for all startups uh, has certainly decreased. We're certainly seeing... Uh, kind of washing out of the industry right now and, and, and a real transformation in terms of whether or not, you know, companies will persist in, in getting funded. But that doesn't mean that there's not still work to do, that investors are not excited about financial services and fintech. I remain incredibly excited about fintech and insurtech. And I also am seeing some fantastic deals being done you know, just this week, one of my uh, insure tech companies out of London, Flock, announced a $38 million raise. I have another company that's that's raised some money that's going to be announcing also, also a London-based company in a couple of weeks. So I think that great companies with um, doing really interesting things with large addressable markets are still finding funding. And more importantly, I think investors still recognize that there's quite a lot of work to do in our sector and that this is a sector with enormous addressable markets and com- and startups that that do things, you know, with attention to the unit economics and are, you know, scaling quickly, certainly are finding investment. Thank you. Mary, what do you think? Do the, do the, I'm going to ask you this one rather than Ruth. I mean, how important are the decisions of these big venture capital firms? I mean, do, do they, do you think they really affect, um, you know, the shape of the industry, the shape of fintech? Um, do they have ripple effects through you know, more widely. Does it matter what Sequoia um, or Andreessen Horowitz do and say? I think ultimately it really does because as we can all attest to, VC does shape the businesses of tomorrow or tomorrow's tomorrow in the next 10 years. So um, the kind of places where they're putting their money within fintech is really exciting to see what uh, will gain traction and what will grow and ultimately what will most likely end up using or being impacted by in some way. So it is really interesting to see those sectors that they particularly decided to hone in on. And as fintech growth leader at Seckle, I'm often speaking to loads of different fintech founders, easily um, a, a couple a week. Um, and I've definitely noticed um, what Ruth shared as well, um, less early stage fintechs um, popping up. Those that are kind of struggling, being, I guess, feeling a bit more exposed because there's less later stage funding available. But I guess it does uh, mean there's less noise. And actually, it comes back to kind of the core principles of like, 
um, as Ruth mentioned already, thinking about your unit economics, what is your unique selling point? Um, really focusing on growth and marketing is what I've seen a lot of our fintechs that we power today focus on as well. Fantastic. Um, Lena, I don't know if you noticed that Sequoia, both Sequoia and 8016Z had invested in payments, which sort of implies it's you know, one of the most important sectors. I guess that's, I'm not sure that's good news or bad news for you because it might be more com- more competitors. Um, but hasn't everything in payments already been done? I mean, you know, Ruth was saying, oh, you know, there's all these opportunities. What are some of the challenges in payments that haven't been addressed yet? Yeah, I think that's a really relevant question. And um, I, I get that question quite a bit, actually. But I would argue that, first of all, there is a pretty large number of pain points um, that are still visible in today's payment ecosystem. Um, perhaps not as much from the consumer side necessarily always, but definitely on the merchant side. Um, payments is still incredibly fragmented. Um, there's huge regional differences. You only need to speak to the average mid-sized European online retailer with regards to how easy they feel it is to navigate basically their payments infrastructure today. So I think there is much to be done in the current setup. I mean, me personally working in the account to account payment space, which is predicted to be overtaking a lot of the cart volumes um, in Europe, clearly there's a reason why we all believe that's going to happen. So I think there's much to be solved in, in the here and now, but we just had a lengthy discussion, for example, about chat GBT and how that might impact the way that we produce um, or consume content, for example, it may eventually further down the road also impact the way that we buy things. And then in conjunction with that, perhaps the way that we pay for things will change. And obviously, there'll be a need for payment businesses to be um, keeping up with changed consumer behavior. Um, So to that extent, I think there will always be um, improvements to be made and adaptations um, to be built. Um, to make sure that both consumers and merchants alike get the best possible payments experience. So I've never been, um, personally, I've I've never actually believed in the death of fintech. I always felt that there was rather, perhaps from the, uh, my friends who are in in, in the venture capital space or even funds that I've spoken to, perhaps there's been a shift of attention towards other segments, such as, for example, insure tech um, was was one sector that was, of course, course gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, But I don't think that sort of any of them ever really subscribe to the death of fintech per se so so speaking of things that have been written off then um blockchain is obviously the the primary subject of our sister podcast blockchain insider but also um uh, where a16z put a lot of its money uh this year despite the the drop in valuations um what did you all think about uh that uh do you think uh, is it still a lot of life left still a lot of big opportunities in blockchain well i'd say that it's probably not despite the change in valuations, but because of it. I mean, if you have capital to deploy, then lower valuations is really attractive. But in some ways, I think, you know, they've been uh, so vocal about the their belief in the power of, you know, blockchain-based technologies and, and crypto. You know, it would be pretty strange to just completely sort of shift because we're in a kind of crypto winter or a down market. And so I think that for most people who have been interested in crypto, you know, since the Satoshi white paper, um, (laughs) they're not going to veer strongly away, even if we see some maybe of the of the hype cycle moving a little bit away from crypto. I I don't think it's entirely surprising. And certainly when you have um, a very, very, very vibrant market, uh, it can be very difficult for investors uh, to to continue to invest uh, as 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 was happening in in 21. Fantastic. Mary, I'm going to ask you to wrap this rip this topic up. Um, do you think the sort of downturn in the past year has sort of changed the relationship between investors and fintechs? Or do you think there is still that sort of strong belief in the potential of fintech? Wow. Um, feels like it, I could write a whole essay on that topic. But I think it's really interesting. I think there's generally still a lot of faith in fintech as a sector. And I think one thing I've definitely noticed is like how many sub branches there are under fintech. We've spoken a bit about insure tech, payroll, payments, everything. There's, it feels like the term is becoming um, uh, larger and larger in, in terms of what it um, encompasses. And it comes back to, I guess, that famous quote around one day everything will be a fintech because there'll be some kind of link into fintech. And I think that's from Andreessen Horowitz as well. So um, yeah, I think, 
uh, fintech is not dead. I think uh, you guys often talk about how fintech is 1% finished and maybe we're 2% finished, um, but there's still <laughs> lots of uh, progress to be made as well. There's definitely lots of opportunity and lots of unsolved problems. Okay. Well, now for the section of the show called Big Click Energy, which is just a quick fire roundup of some of the more clickworthy news from the week. It's just me on the hosting duties today, so I'll take us through these stories very quickly and then bring you all back together. So, uh, Nigeria's cash crisis has provided a boon for fintech and mobile money operators, according to Fitch, and this was reported in Business Insider Africa. Nigeria is experiencing a cash crisis due to a demonetization effort by the Central Bank of Nigeria. This has caused considerable social unrest, but the crisis has been a short-term boon for the country's fintechs and mobile money operators, such as MTN and Airtel Africa. The lack of physical money in circulation has been a significant catalyst to the adoption of digital financial services, as consumers have been forced to adopt digital methods of payment at point of sale. The impetus behind the Central Bank of Nigeria's decision to replace higher denomination banknotes was to lower the amount of cash in circulation, control liquidity and inflation, and stimulate the shift to a cashless economy. According to Fitch, mobile money operators are well-placed to capitalise on Nigeria's unbanked population. To find out more, we reached out to Jay Alabrava, co-founder of Nigerian mobile payments company Paga, to ask how fintechs are currently filling the gaps left by the lack of cash. The currency redesign policy, um, in spite of the challenges that it has introduced to the market, has also been a great opportunity to introduce more and more customers to digital options for making payments and doing their transactions. Similar to what happened during the pandemic, starting in uh, early 2020, um, even customers that were reluctant to give up the cash option when making trades or doing transactions um, were forced to start to look for alternative ways, right? They're able to sign up for wallets and able to fund the wallets through transfers from bank accounts or for whichever other sources and able to use these to make payments to any other financial institution in Nigeria for instant credit. Of course, some challenges exist or still exist that have hindered the growth of digital payments, things like network connectivity in the more remote parts of the country or the smartphone penetration, which is growing, but not as fast as we would like. Um, For this reason, we always look for alternative ways for people to connect. So USSD on low level 2G phones is available as a way to transact on Paga. And we have also launched cards which make it easy for people to do transactions wherever they are and a card is accepted. We have a Pan-African mandate and our vision goes beyond simply, you know, creating more access points or, or various ways to access and use your money, but it also goes to products as well, where we are working with partners to deliver more and more value to customers around insurance, around investments, around credit. And I think all these will be incentives for more people to adopt the digital options. So this uh, story from Nigeria reminds me very much of what happened in India um, about five years ago when the Indian government similarly um, tried to demonetize and got rid of a lot of the sort of larger denomination banknotes, which similarly caused a lot of unrest, a lot of unhappiness, but then resulted in widespread adoption of Um, digital payments in India, paving the way for the huge successes of firms like Paytm and PhonePay, all based on the underlying technology stack uh, known as the India stack and uh, the UPI interface, uh, Unified Payments Interface, um, and the Aadhaar digital certificates that enable Indians, you know, billion, literally the billion Indians uh, to all identify themselves. I'm not sure that Nigeria has built the same kind of infrastructure yet, um, but I'm sure that we will see very similar effects of widespread adoption of digital payments. Of course, this isn't the biggest story in Nigeria uh, right now because of the uh, election that's being contested, and that, of course, is driving a fair amount of unrest in the country there too. So best wishes to uh, all our listeners in Nigeria that that gets resolved um, peacefully and rightfully. Okay. Next story is that Klarna has announced a billion dollars in losses while Revolut has declared its first annual profitability, two of Europe's leading fintech unicorns. So Swedish buy now pay later 
giant Klarna has posted a $1 billion loss for 2022, 47% up from its $680 million loss in 2021. The company has been promising investors a pathway to profitability in 2023, with Q4 figures showing a steady growth in gross merchandise volume and a 19% uplift in revenue. But Klarna last made a full-year profit in 2018, and a costly expansionist growth policy has come at a price. Meanwhile, Revolut, the UK's most valuable fintech company, has revealed its first annual profit in its much-delayed annual accounts. The fintech company declared a profit of £26.3 million in the year to December 2021, and the company's revenues rose from £220 million in 2020 to £636 million in 2021. However, uh, the accountancy firm BDO said in the delayed 2021 annual report that its staff were unable to get a complete picture of some of the company's revenue, and as a result, some financial balances could be materially misstated. So, wow, there's a lot to unpack in those two stories. Um, Klarna, of course, has has grown rapidly, but has been hit by the cost of living crisis and the credit downturn. It's always challenging if you're trying to build a lending business the problem is how do you get the money back any anyone can give money away it's getting it back that's a challenge so Klarna got a big challenge there to turn that around a billion dollars is a lot of money to lose even on a big base um so interesting to see how sentiment on on Klarna will turn over the next uh, year or two great that Revolut is making a profit even if a relatively small one it's clearly got the potential but scary to have your accountants saying they can't quite be certain of your numbers and they can't quite be certain there's a mistake, particularly when you're trying to get a banking license. So that's deeply uncomfortable for Revolut because you really, really, really don't want anyone wondering where the money is in a bank. Um, Not that Revolut is a bank yet in the UK. Um, So super interesting stories, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about both of those over the next uh, few months. So um, best of luck to both of those companies. Okay, let's bring everyone back for the final section, looking at a more light-hearted story from the past week. This is that uh, this was reported in the UK's independent newspaper, um, which is that real estate influencers have sparked a heated debate after arguing that tenants should tip landlords. So two real estate influencers have sparked a debate about tipping culture after they argued that landlords should receive tips from their tenants. The two men, who go by the username at Two Guys Take On Real Estate on TikTok, have more than 889,000 followers and shared the message in a video. In the skit, the TikTok influencers acted out a scenario where a tenant is faced with an iPad tipping screen after paying their monthly rent. A tip? I'm not tipping my landlord, says one of the men playing a tenant. To which the landlord replies, So you'll tip a barista who pours overpriced coffee in a cup, but not the guy who is on call 24-7 to make sure you have a safe home. He continues, You'll tip an extra 25% for somebody to carry you a basket of chicken wings, but you won't tip someone who responds for after-hours emergency calls. Well, I guess when it's time for your lease renewal, I'm going to make sure gratuities are included in your rent. So as of 28th of February, the video had been viewed more than 358,000 times on TikTok, where viewers have expressed their hope that the TikTok skit is satire. Uh, (laughs) So where do we start? Um, Ruth, tipping. Is tipping culture out of control? So I'm American, as you can tell from my accent, and it does feel like this generalized culture, um, you know, in that is very American, also on the basis of the wages that are paid to uh, restaurant workers specifically, has become somewhat generalized. And I have heard, uh, you know, a lot of people anecdotally complaining about uh, the Apple Pay formats, which encourage tipping and where people feel socially pressured. This feels like the class warfare segment, so I'm I'm, I'm not going to go too deeply into it. (laughs) But I will say that I hope that my uh, daughter, uh, first of all, I hope she actually did delete TikTok. She said she did. But if she didn't, I hope she sees it and decides to tip me as her landlord. <laughs> Lena, um, is, is there an argument for tipping landlords? No, I, w- I would say no. But um, arguably, this is somewhat sort of um, maybe based on the American lens here over in Europe. I, to be honest, I haven't even seen my landlord in years. Um, and it's actually a corporation, so I, there's no face to my landlord, I would say. And um, I haven't seen anybody service the building in a long time. So even if I did want to tip them, I'd be hard-pressed to do so. 
And um, I can come, I can come to think of many other professions that I would, that I believe deserve tips. Um, landlords probably are not among them in all fairness, in my point of view. Mary, who, who do you think doesn't get tipped, but definitely deserves a tip? Who are the underappreciated workers of the world? Yeah, I think it's the obvious suspects, um, the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers. There's a whole load of other TikToks complaining about landlords and the quality of housing. So, um, yeah, my, I'd much rather tip doctors, nurses, etc. Any other sort of unconventional tippers from uh, Ruth or Lena? Any others you'd add to Mary's very good list? I would just love everyone to get paid a living wage. I agree with uh, with what's been said. And I must say, essential workers of all kinds would have been top of my agenda as well. I think the COVID pandemic has shown that, that there's uh, professions that don't really quite get the recognition they deserve and they would be on top of my list. Okay, fantastic. Living, living wage. All right. Well, that wraps up this week's news show. Thank you so much um, to my three wonderful guests today. Where can people find out a little bit more about you, uh, Ruth? So if you want to reach me, you can find me on Twitter at Fox News. That is F-O-X-E underscore news. And if you want to find out about WVCE, uh, you can go to WVCE.tech. And can we follow you on TikTok? Nope. <laughs> and Mary. Yes, um, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Mary Abbasama, um, and Sekel. You can find us out more about what we do at Sekel.tech. And Lena. You'll find me on brightpayments.com or on LinkedIn. Probably the easiest way to get in touch if you wanted to do so. And as for me, Benjamin Ensor, I'm on uh, LinkedIn, or you can find out more about what we do at 11FS on 11FS.com. So thank you all so much to you for listening. Um, please do join the conversation on social media or email us at podcasts at 11 fscom Thank you all so much for listening and thank you to my wonderful guests and goodbye. Goodbye.